uh, welcome to today's research day seminar. My name is Efriani Juita, but feel free to call me Ita. And I'm honored uh, to be your moderator for this event. The Research Education uh, Division of the Faculty of Psychology in University of Indonesia regularly hosts uh, this research day seminar. And its session, the lab research group within our faculty share the research experience and finding and all uh, to foster research interest uh, among faculty members and the academic community, while also disseminating uh, research finding to the public. And today, it's the turn to our uh, lifespan development lab to take the spotlight. And before we dive into the presentation of our three speaker here, let me give you a brief introduction first about our lab. The lifespan development lab coordinated by Doni Hendrawan, PhD, or Mas Doni, currently has six members, uh, Buike, Anggraika, myself, uh, Mbak Cut Nurul Kemala, uh, Mbak Inge, Mbak Adin, and Joshua. Formerly, we known uh, uh, as an executive function lab group, but now our research focus not only on executive function development, but we focus on various aspects of human development, such as play development, social cognition in children, teenagers, and adults. We also deeply interest in how parenting practice influence human development. Our lab is also open to collaboration with other universities, schools, institutions, and uh, all. Uh, people who share the same research interest with us. And as part of our commitment to collaboration, uh, today's seminar is held in partnership with the Behavioral Science Institute, BSI, at Red Boat University in the Netherlands. And to the, topic, the topic for today's seminar is the use of vignette in research. Vignette or stimuli made up of description of people, object, or situation combining various characteristics are widely used in psychology and other social science. Uh, so today we are going to hear from our speaker today, uh, here today. Uh, their experience using vignette in research, and let's give a warm welcome to our speaker, Haide, Wika, Joshua, how are you? You're doing great? Okay, wonderful. Okay, before we begin, I would like to read a brief introduction about our speaker here, Dr. Dr. Hide Beckwis is an assistant professor at the Behavioral Science Institute and an assistant professor in orthopedagogic learning and development. He is also a sport enthusiast, both as a practitioner and researcher. And today he will discuss constructing vignette in research. And our second speaker is Bu Ike Anggraika, Embassy Psychologist. Uh, she's known as... For all of you, uh, I encourage to mute your microphone so it won't disturb the uh, presentation. Okay. Buika is a senior member of the Lifespan Development Lab, and she is also a coordinator in the Clinical Child Psychology Master Program. And her current research focuses on social cognition in children, such as theory of mind, emotional mental state talk, and parenting practices. And our last uh, speaker, third speaker, is Joshua Gabriel. She is the youngest member in our lab, 
<laughs> he joined the lifespan development lab as a research assistant after graduating in 2021 i hope it's correct joshua and next month not next month i think next week yeah joshua <laughs> he will begin his master study in psychology measuring uh personality right okay Okay, uh, the guideline for uh, this seminar is each of our speaker will have 30 minutes for their presentation. And during presentation, uh, please, uh, all the participants, uh, please mute your microphone so it won't disturb the, participation, uh, the presentation. And we encourage participants to write down the question in the Zoom chat to avoid forgetting them as the Q&A session will be put in the end of the seminar. Of course, you also may ask directly to our speaker during the Q&A session. I also would like to remind you that all participants who stay until the end of the event and complete the survey sent by the committee via the chat box will receive an e-certificate so don't forget to stay until this event is over okay without further ado i invite dr hide bequist to begin his presentation the time is yours hide okay thanks Ita. um yeah welcome um yeah i'm in nijmegen so it is here early in the morning of early i just brought the kids to school so it is uh 9 a.m uh, and I didn't expect 63 participants in this session because in Nijmegen or in the Netherlands, uh, when we do something on Friday, and for you it is Friday afternoon, uh, most people aren't there. So I'm I'm surprised by the uh, how many people are going. So um, I try to do uh, my best. Um, I start my presentation. Um, sharing wasn't the problem when we tested, but stopping was the problem. So we shall see how it goes. Uh, so, the title of my presentation is Experimental Vignette Studies in Online Survey Research. Um, yeah, like Ita said, I'm Hitte Beckhuis and I'm working at the Rabot University as an as a, uh, assistant professor. I have a background in uh, quantitative sociology. Um, and in sociology in the Netherlands, we do a lot of, res of uh, questionnaire research. So I have more than 20 years of experience with designing uh, questionnaires, including uh, questionnaires with vignettes. Um, so what I'm going to do today is start very basic, from very basic vignette studies to very complex vignette studies, which we call conjoint experiments. Um, and I tell a bit about the basics, how to design them and also how to analyze them. Um, yeah, my idea is that we have uh, I try around 20 minutes and then maybe we can also have a little Q&A uh, but we shall see how it goes um, so very basic what is a vignette study vignette studies are use short description of situations or or persons and which we call vignettes that are usually shown to respondent within a survey in order to elect their judgment about these scenarios um, and by systematically varying the levels of theoretically important vignette characteristics, a large population of vign different vignettes is typically, typically available. Um, and which I'm going to show you, it will be too large to present it at, to each respondent. So the question is, how do we select that subject, subset of vignettes? So how do you present this subset? Is that random? So just give them a random uh, subset or is that structured? Um, and of course it will be structured uh, and I explain later how you can do that. But first we start very basic with uh, a very basic vignette study. Um, this is a very classic one. This is from uh, the LIS panel. This is a very big uh, internet panel in the Netherlands. Um, there are different opinions about men or women 
there are different opinions about men or women should look after home and family. According to your own opinion, who should look after home and family? So you have a story about men and women or the choice between men and women who should take care of the household. Um, you only have one vignette, namely men or women and one situation. So this is very simple. Um, so this gives you a di digitominous answer, um, but you can also rephrase this question a little bit. And then this is not sec a vignette anymore, or it is a vignette, but you have more answer categories. Um, this is from our MyFair research, um, of our MyFair uh, survey that we conduct in, I think already, eight years ago. Um, this was still a paper pencil study. So respondents uh, get a, a written questionnaire and they should sign, uh, uh, fill it out with, uh, with old school paper. Um, but here the question is, do you agree or disagree with the following statements? A man's job is to earn money. A woman's job is to look after the home and family. And then you have five answer categories. The benefit of that is that you have more variation in your answer categories and you can use another analytical method. So you can use just the ordinary linear regression analysis to analyze this uh, question. While with the first one, with the real vignette design, you have um, you have to use logistic regression, and then it is a little bit harder. Or is it really harder? But it can be a little bit more difficult to interpret the results. So when you only have two answer categories, you want to choose between man and woman. Um, you can say, okay, maybe a real vignettes in design isn't the best design because you lost a lot of variation um, because you only have two answer categories um, with the answers. And then you can prefer uh, the, uh, the, the, the other uh, option like I show you here. Okay. Again, a very basic vignette study. Uh, the MyFair, as you can see, the My it is also from the MyFair uh, questionnaire. And the MyFair uh, research, we looked at the opinion of not, you know, of recent migrants from not common, not the typical countries uh, about their opinion about the welfare state. Uh, so we asked them uh, about Japanese migrants, American migrants, Philippine mi migrants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is not the common groups in the Netherlands, which are Turkish, American, um, but that is what the whole questionnaire about. Um, but this is also uh, a perfect example of an easy of very basic vignettes question. Regarding social policies and health policies, do you think that the decision should be made mainly by the Dutch government, mainly by the European Union or jointly? So you will have a story who should make the decision about social policies and health policies. And we have three options, the Dutch government, the the EU, the European Union, of jointly. Um, so you can say you can use logistic regression or multinomial logistic regression if you want to look at the three options. Um, but this still, this is very basic. You can use, you can present all because it are only three answer options. You can present it to all the respondent, uh, respondents. And you can even do it by paper pencil because it is so, yeah, you only have three options. If you're going to be a bit more complex, also from the MyFair uh, survey, you get this. This question is, some people think that immigrants in the Netherlands contribute more in taxes than they benefit from social benefits and services. Other people think they benefit more from social benefits and services than they contribute in taxes. When you think about the following groups, what comes closer to your own point of view? And then you can choose between migrants from the US, migrants of countries from Western 
European Union, migrants from countries of the Eastern European Union, migrants from poor countries outside Europe, migrants from rich countries outside Europe. So we have five um, groups or subjects, five types of migrants, and then you can choose between they contribute more or they benefit more or it is equal. Um, and because we don't want the people going to guess, we also give them the options don't know. But still, although it's, this is a bit more complex because you have five uh, groups and three answer options, you can present it in, in one simple um, figure like we did here. Uh, and especially when you do it online, you can even make it more e easy to, to, to show. Um, so, but the analysis will be, analysis will, analyzing this will be a bit more complex, uh, although you still use uh, multinomial, uh, multinomial logistic regression, or you can choose uh, if you only want to say, okay, I, I only interested in uh, who are contributing more or who are benefiting more, they also can use normal logistic regression analysis. Um, so that is still pretty straightforward. Um, and then we go to the more, real more complex uh, vignette studies. Um, this we have done very recent of last year of a uh, PhD project of um, a PhD students of mine in which we look to the uh, who is choosing a, a sports partner. So what are the characteristics of someone who, who you want to sports with? Um, and then we make that people um, can choose a sports partner based on if they are how social they are, so social comparison uh, on their knowledge about training and technique, um, about their companionship, and about their encouragement. And from each of those four uh, aspects, we have three um, levels. So with social comparison, uh, someone who really likes to compare sport performances to somewhat likes to compare sport performances and does not like to compare sport performances. So from somebody who is very competitive um, and on, the comp so on the sport performance uh, aspect or not at all. So in total, you have 81 possibilities. So we call this a full factor factorial design with 81 possibilities because we have three options four times. Then you get three to the fourth, which is 81. And of course, it is not possible to present 81 possibilities to uh, respondents because that is way too much. Um, so what we have done, Um, we create a choice set and uh, we do that we did that uh, by sampling three alternate alternatives from the full factual design without replacement so we have 81 uh, opportunities and we draw yeah a sample from that uh, and we presented three choice sets per respondent. You can you can ask, okay, why three? Why not ten? Or why not two? Or um, that is mostly done by the time you have, or the, the space you have in a survey. Um, you must think it because this is part of a larger survey in which we had a little room, so that is why we are limited to three. The more, the better. Um, but there is also some, something that's called uh, respondent fatigue, that the respondents get tired of doing the same. So it should be not too long. So when uh, five minutes per question for five minutes for this subset, that is already too long. 
Um, so, and then finally, the order of the the, the choice sets varied, varied randomly between the uh, respondents uh, to avoid order effects. Um, so this is why, how we came up to our sample and how does it look like in reality? Um, we program it in Lime Survey because this is an online, you can only do this uh, with online, uh, not completely, but it is e easier to do this in, uh, with online questionnaires than, um, than in paper pencil questionnaires. Uh, so it looked like this. Uh, and the question was, some people mainly exercise alone, others mainly with others. Imagine that you have that you have exercised together with the people described below. If you had to make a choice, who would you work out with again? So person one is really likes to compare sport performances, know less than you about effect training and right technique, exercise, exercise to socially engage, never encourage you. And person two had other uh, characteristics like does not like to compare sport performances, know less than you about effect, effective training and the right technique, wants a combination of social interaction and pur 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 purposeful training, and sometimes encourage you. Um, and the third person has another characteristics. And then the respondent can choose person one, person two, person three, and then they get two other um, descriptions. Um, so, like I said, the, comp the, the, the description of the persons we showed here are based on the sample, of drawing a sample from the 81 um, options we have without a replacement. So, nice. You can do this so you, you can know which people uh, have a, uh, what type of uh, person they want to work out with or they want to support with. But how do you analyze that? Because a normal regression analysis or doesn't work here because you have so many um, options. So what you use are marginal means and conditional marginal means. Um, since it isn't a statistical workshop here, um, I give you a reference. You can read about it. Uh, this is here, the, the work of Heinmüller, Hopkins, and uh, Yamato uh, from 2014. Causal in inference and conjoint analysis, understanding multiple multidimensional choices via stated performance experiments. Um, and of course, I want to show, going to show you how it looks like in uh, reality. Um, this is from the article of Rob, my PhD student. Uh, it is, I think it is still under review. Um, so this is what you get with the marginal means. Marginal means reflect the percentage point deviating from the baseline prob probability of 0.33, because we have three possibilities. If you have four possibilities, so four answer categories per uh, item, it is 0.25. So then it's the baseline 0.25 for choosing sport partners without specific feature levels. And we presented the 95% confidence intervals, which are calculated via OLS regression with clustered standard error. So yes, and marginal means are just nothing more than uh, ordinary linear uh, regression. Uh, but you, pre represent, you present it differently. You can present the, uh, the baseline of the, 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 the standard effects which you normally should do. And then you see, for example, that encouragement is very important because almost 15% choose less sport partners who never encourage you. Uh, and if we go to the intent, so why do people, why do we sport, sport partner sport? Uh, social effect 
is the marginal is at the marginal mean. Uh, but if it is social plus purpose, then it is almost yeah, it's twelve percent more. Uh, but, but when it is only per per purposeful, then it's twelve percent less. Uh, knowledge, you see that only less knowledge has an effect, of uh, is more negative, but equal and more, a little bit more. Uh, a performance comparison, um, then it is, should be really like, isn't positive to choose a support partner from, it is more somewhat like and uh, dislike, people choose more than support partner. So this is the way you can use marginal means. Um, but still, you want to control for some effects. For example, from is there a difference between men and women? Um, people who are sport more or less, or people who are active or inactive. Then you can do conditional marginal means, and then you um, calculate the marginal means for different groups. Um, here we did, for example, for gender. That's the right column. Um, and then you can see there are differences, but not that much differences uh, for men and women. For example, here, the performance comparison, then you see that men are more, I don't see it. I don't know if you see my cursor, but you can see if you were to look to the right blue dot, that women choose uh, more often a sports partner that uh, dislikes performance comparison in contrast to a man. Uh, where do we see I have another big difference? Oh, here, for example, when people with the sports frequency, in the middle column, and if we look to the intent for why people sports, um, we see a difference between uh, the, the sports frequency between uh, high, which are the blue uh, dots, and uh, low, which are the yellow dots. That purposeful sporting uh, is even more worse of for um, for people who sport not that much but it is still negative for both. So this is the way to look at uh, marginal, conditional marginal means, which is are also ordinary least square regression analysis, but then split up by groups uh, and presented in this way. Um, we have done that in R, the, 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 the stati statistical packages, and you can get it directly from it. So R is the way to go for, for this. Um, now, the take-home message. Um, I think vignette studies are pretty st straightforward. You have a story and two or more options to choose from. Um, but until, say, say five, six uh, options, it is feasible to present it in an easy way, like I show you with the, um, no, with the examples. But when you get more complex, it will be yeah, very differ of a difficult. Uh, and you should do something with the, the, the sample. Um, or you should draw a sample from the possibilities, which I show you in the last one with the conjoint experiment. Uh, and online vignette studies are therefore offer therefore more possibilities than classic paper and pencil studies, but still they are still possible. And the more options to choose, the more complex the analysis will be. However, all is based on yeah, regression analysis, so it isn't that difficult. And that is what I want to tell. Um, I didn't see the chat uh, at all, so I stopped sharing my screen, and then I uh, yeah, stop sharing my screen. Um, I was wondering if some people already have questions because. I did now 20 minutes, and I think we have 10 minutes left. Okay, Hide, uh, probably yeah. uh, we are going to put uh, the question and answer after all the three speakers. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it's okay. That's fine. Yeah, 
and uh, participant uh, who have already a question for Hida, you may write down your question uh, in the Zoom chat. So you won't forget your question uh, that dedicated to Hida. Okay, uh, great presentation. And I, I believe uh, many of the participants would uh, want to ask you more about your presentation. But next we have Bu Ike. Uh, yeah. who is ready to share her experience on uh, adaptation uh, of the vignette studies. Uh, Buika, are you ready? Yes. Okay. The floor is yours, Bu. Thank you so much, Ita. Okay. There is my presentation. Ah. Okay. Okay, good morning, Hida. Good afternoon, Joshua. And good afternoon for all fellow lecturers and students who attend this uh, research talk. It is, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm very honored with this opportunity to share the topic of using and adapting vignette in psychological uh, research. So I've been using a uh, vignette for my research, especially on the topic of a uh, social cognition and theory of mind development and the, in this uh, result talk <clears throat> in this result talk uh, session i will share my experience in adapting vignette for use in indonesian culture so my presentation i hope that is uh, on, i can present uh, briefly about definition of a vignette and vignette in uh, developmental psychology uh, the challenge and limitation of a uh, vignette uh, and then benefits and also uh, the process of uh, adapting a, a vignette. Okay. okay, what is vignette? As uh, Hida already mentioned that a uh, vignette uh, involves a short scenario in written or sometimes uh, with children. I, uh, it can be also uh, found that uh, there are vignette uh, content picture that intended to elicit response to typical uh, uh, scenario. So the, here's a uh, uh, tree of a uh, definition of vignette. Uh, I don't need to explain uh, uh, all of this and yeah, in short, that uh, vignette uh, is a short narrative scenario to study particular psychological concept of phenomena. And this scenario are often a hypothetical situation or scenario that illustrates specific psychological principle of theory. Sorry, Hida, I'm in the psychology department, so I will uh, I will present, I will uh, focus on the psychology. Uh, and then uh, the, char uh, the characteristic of a vignette uh, is usually uh, fictional or hypothetical. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's uh, well, near real life uh, situation, but most of all is uh, most of the time is uh, fictional or hypothetical. And then focus on a specific concept, for example, theory of mind, and uh, using language and imaginary to engage participant and makes the psychological concept more relatable. So it's a kind of uh, using uh, language, but it's different from uh, the uh, questionnaire or the inventory. So in uh, area of developmental psychology, uh, vignette is typically used for research with children. Children uh, are very uh, eager. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, usually we, uh, with children, they are very eager to uh, respond with uh, to vignette. And then common them found in research on vignette involving children usually in the area of cognitive and social cognition development 
like for example, children understanding of others' thought, feeling, and belief, and emotional uh, development, and in the moral development, especially about moral reasoning and moral decision-making process. So this is a, an example of a vignette that I have employed in my current uh, research project is a strange uh, story task. The strange story task is developed by, was developed by uh, Elizabeth Hartwig and revised by White in 2009. It's widely used vignette for assessing theory of mind ability in older children. And this SST or a Strange story station, uh, situation, strange story task is divided into eight con control stories and eight mental stories designed to evaluate the capacity to understand mental state such as belief, uh, intention, and emotion. So usually at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, vignette, uh, participants were are asked to uh, are to ask to answer a question to assess their understanding about the character's mental state. For example, what is the character, the, the character thinking or feeling? Uh, what is the character acts in particular way? What is the explanation of that, etc. So here is the example uh, about uh, two uh, boys named Bruce and James live in Queensland. Uh, they both are uh, 10 years old, etc. So uh, after reading this, uh, this is the vignette and then there are some uh, uh, there are questions about the the uh, the vignette. And in my uh, experience using uh, vignettes, uh, there are uh, some challenges and limitations. It's not only this three, but I find uh, it's this. This is more uh, what is this more uh, common uh, challenge and limitation. Uh, we need to consider that we need to uh, be aware that some. Uh, challenge and limitation of using vignette. Some, uh, one of them is a offer simplified scenario. So for example, to fit, to fit within a vignette format, complex social issue may need to be simplified. So uh, leading to a reductionist of view of reality. So it's not uh, capture all the, 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 uh, all the reality. And some, uh, Finet can uh, especially that deal a uh, sensitive in, uh, topic like moral dilemma can evoke strong emotional relation uh, reaction <clears throat> in participant. So we need to be careful with the uh, especially with children uh, with this uh, emotional impact and. Most of uh, vignette usually was uh, developed in the Eastern uh, countries, Western countries, I mean. So there are some cultural differences that need to be considered. Vignette may not, vignette, <clears throat> vignette might not adapt well across different cultural or social contexts. So what seems realistic or relevant in one culture may not resonate in another culture. So it's leading to a difference in how participants and understand and respond to the scenario. So we need to be careful with this, uh, usually with this uh, 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 limitation. So I will uh, discuss more in the uh, next uh, presentation. So, although we have to be aware of some in the some uh, of the some challenges and weakness in using vignettes, there are some benefit of using vignettes, especially in research involving uh, children. 
and this benefit will only be achieved if we address the challenge in previous uh, previously uh, mentioned. So uh, the first benefit is allow researcher to present participant with scenario that mirror real life situation. So it's for children, it's more fun than a, a questionnaire or an interview. Uh, and it also can be tailored to be age appropriate using language and situations that are understandable and engaging for children. And especially for children, it reduces social disability bias as children may provide more genuine response to the hypothetical scenario than to direct question about their own behavior or attitude. So it's a benefit for, uh, especially for a, a researcher in the area of uh, developmental psychology. And Vignette also can facilitate thing, uh, cross-cultural research. So because a Vignette can be adapted to different cultural contexts, allowing researcher to explore how culture influence behavior or thinking process or belief. And the scenario also can be modified to reflect local custom and practice. So this is one of the vignettes that I have used in my cross-cultural research. It's about uh, morally relevant theory of mind uh, developed by Killen. Killen's work focus on the intersection of moral development and theory of mind, and her vignette was used to study how children understand moral issues, social, social con conflicts, and the perspective of others. So you can see this uh, story, the vignette is about David or Diane is, yeah, we choose which, uh, uh, which one we can present David and then uh, we can present also Martin. And if the participant is a girl, we say that this is Diane. So uh, pointing to the picture of Diane and this is Mar uh, Mary pointing to picture of Mary. Diane is playing on the swings outside. Mary comes over and push her on the swing so that she can get on the on it. Diane falls down on the ground and hurt her knees. So it's different from Hida uh, who uh, have a, a different, uh, oh, like close-ended uh, uh, answer. In uh, my research, we use uh, more uh, what is this open-ended question? So, for example, the question is, uh, when Mary pushed Diane, did Mary think she was doing something that was right, all right or not all right? And then the open-ended is why? Why? So, and there's uh, uh, one vignette can, be, uh, can have more than one question. So you see that in this vignette, we have one, two, three, four, five questions actually. So every question need to be a score and yeah, to be scored and evaluate. So using this vignette in the research is not difficult. As we know that swinging games are quite common and well known among Indonesian children. I think most of Indonesian children, most of the children in the world know uh, the sw uh, swinging, swing, ayunan. So therefore, in this study, we simply translate the story and only replace the character's name with names that are more familiar or common to Indonesian children. So that, for example, David, we change into Budi and Martin into Dino. Diane in Torini and Mary, we change into Nita and we just translate the vignette. But uh, how about the vignette in this, uh, in the strange situation uh, task? 
So this uh, vignette uh, or SST uh, was designed to measure advanced uh, theory of mind, particularly the ability to understand others' mental state, such as belief, intention, and emotion in a complex social situation for older, older children and adolescents. This is one of the example in the mental, I think it's in the mental stories. I know, in the control stories. Uh, there's a story about Jewel who has never been skiing and looking forward for his skiing holiday in winter in New Zealand. So we can see that skiing in winter holiday is not common activity for most Indonesian. So we cannot just translate as the previous uh, vignette with the uh, mo motto, morally theory of mind with the, yeah. So it's need more than just translation. So this uh, adaptation of the vignette is necessary before we can use this vignette into uh, for Indonesian uh, children. So this is uh, the steps that we, uh, well, most likely uh, follow in order to uh, uh, adapting a vignette. Of course, we need to select the first of all, we need to select the appropriate vignette uh, according to our research objective. So, after obtaining the vignette, we must we then must identify the stimulus value contained in each scenario. As every scenario or every story was designed to elicit desired behavior or response from the participant. So this process or this uh, no, the, uh, this uh, stimulus value needs to be fully understood by the res by this the researcher. So that uh, the stimulus value does not change during the adaptation process. So we need to be careful with the stimulus value. Otherwise, the stimulus value, the value or the objective of this uh, uh, vignette cannot be, well, uh, well, it will be changed yeah, during the uh, adaptation process. The next step is translating and adapting. So we need to be, uh, well, consider three uh, uh, points here. The first one is cultural context and also context. Uh, every cultural context have a sensitivity. So cultural context and sensitivity and then contextual relevant and then also participant relevant characteristics. After all the stories of the vignette have been carefully adapted, and then the pilot study is conducted. We conduct, uh, conducted a, a pilot testing of pilot study. So uh, in the pilot study, uh, we usually uh well ask around 15 participants with similar characteristic for example ke ke age or social economic status ed or educational background to the target participant so it's not the participant but the target participant so it's different participant than the target participant but with similar characteristic We give the uh, we gave the vignette to the participant, ask them to complete it according to in instruction, and then request their feedback on the vignette. We especially ask their feedback on how the children interpret the vignette and whether they found it engaging and realistic. So we need to consider their point of view, whether they, yeah. Uh, is uh, realistic or engaging. So, and then we make a revision 
according to this uh, feedback. And usually, a second pilot study is needed, especially if we find uh, if we found some uh, stories or item that's still problematic, although it's already uh, adapt and translate, but yeah, one or two uh, vignette uh, still problematic. So because, uh, well, maybe uh, yeah, uh, we we uh, different culture than etc. So we need to, we cannot. We cannot just uh, well uh, take out the vignette out the, but we need to 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 have um uh, to be to make the vignette is more relatable for the children. So sometimes cognitive interviewing with four, you know, four five or six participants is also necessary. So we. Uh, we uh, did cognitive interviewing, especially for the uh, vignette that still the, the problematic vignette. After working and answering the problematic vignette, participants were asked a probing question to clarify their thought process, such as how did you understand this vignette? What was your thought process when you answered the vignette? Did anything about the vignette confuse you? Which one, for example? And do you have any idea how to make this vignette better understood? So we consider a, a, a point of view of the participant. So based on the result of the second study and cognitive interviewing, the vignette were then finalized and ready to be employed. So this is the uh, pilot thing, pilot testing. So uh, let me show you the uh, example. So for example, the first one is uh, define the aim and target participant of the adapted uh, vignette. So firstly, we aim, uh, we we de uh, decide we define the aim and the target participant. For example, assess theory of mind development of Indonesian children with target participant, adolescents, middle SAS, and urban Jakarta. So we did uh, the second step is uh, we did the most uh, easier, the easier one, uh, change the name character to reflect the participant like Jill into, Re into Retno, Peter, into echo and then modify setting uh, like for example one of the vignette was about the picnic at the Yara River and we just modify the setting the, into picnic at Ragunan Zoo or Christmas holiday is a Lebaran holiday or a school holiday depend. And then we look out for the context to relevant. So you see that uh, skiing in winter holiday is not uh, relevant in Indonesia. So we choose it, uh, we modify into surfing in year on holiday, surfing in Bali in year on holiday. And uh, penguin, Antarctica in week modify into monyet to sange and sange bali and sometimes we also need to pay attention to the culturally relevant of the behavior we need sometimes to adjust the behavior to fit or to what is this to be more culturally relevant like independent and brave brave children more in the obedient and helpful children Maybe it's a more, uh, yeah, in the uh, context in in rural area, for example. So we also pay attention to the ethical uh, review uh, to ensure the vignette does not include contents that upset children or participants. Because some 
picture may be a uh, well in other other uh, culture is not is natural but in certain culture is uh, make a uh, a children uh, fear, uh, fear or is not uh, uh, well appropriate for the uh, the certain culture so this is a uh, i would like to share the concrete example so so is a cultural relevant for example this is the the well vignette from a strange situation a strange story uh, task about aunt jane who come to visit peter in his home in brisbane now peter loves his aunt very much etc and you see that uh, wearing boots is not culturally rele relevant in indonesia it's very seldom Indonesian uh, children are wearing but boots. Moreover, UGG, UGG is a brand of boots. It's not available in Indonesia. Maybe in Indonesia, Nike or something is more uh, more uh, popular, familiar. But UGG is I don't I don't think so. It's not uh, uh, it's not available in Indonesia. Perhaps only a small number of participants are familiar with UGG boots. In other words, wearing, wearing kebaya in Central Java and wearing yokai or traditional clothing in Papua are more common and well known among the target participant of the study. This uh, In this uh, study, our target participant is teenager from Java and Papua, uh, from Japanese and Papuan uh, ethnic group. So we try to stay as close as possible to original theme of the story. So we, we change boots. We adapt boots or shoes into kebaya and yokai. So the green... I don't know green the, the blue the blue box here is uh, the original version of the strange strange story situation strange story task is tell about a uh, Jill who who was born in and raised in Sydney she's really she's really wanted to buy a blue healer puppy so blue heller puppy is a young Australian cattle cattle dog breed. <clears throat> so it was translated and adapted into uh, Retno, lahir dan besar in di di Jogja. Because we did a research in the Central Java. So uh, Retno was born and raised in Yogyakarta and we adapt uh, healer puppy in puppy into anak kucing or kitten because in the research context was in Java where people are more inclined to keep cats than dogs however when we when the research was conducted in Papuan participants, the story was changed into Sarja and Papi, because in our pilot study, the data indicate that people in Papua are more likely to keep dogs than cats. Okay, Baita. Do I have still have, do I have still have time? Uh yes, you may continue Wika, maybe five more minutes. Five minutes, five minutes. Okay. So here is a, a example of adapted vignette. The vignette was taken from the one of the control stories within strange story tasks. So please read the original version. 
the penguin in Antarctica. This one is the original version. And the adapted version. Can you guess the stimulus value of these two stories? Who can guess? Anyone? What is the stimulus value? Okay. No one? Okay. So, the adaptation process was quite challenging because we had to stay close to original stimulus while making sure it relate with Indonesian participant. So it's a, uh, this is a story about a penguin who take turn to make a, to what is this, um, yeah, a take turn uh, so that it's a friends or a, uh, yeah, groups, uh, group member can have, a, a, can uh, be warm together. So it's a uh, in this uh, story about um, monkey in Sangeh Gianyar, and it also tells that the monkey in the front have to be uh, changed into changes changing place, so it can be uh, so it can be uh, give the opportunity to the other monkey to uh, uh, to apa ya cari kutu tuh apa mbak Ita ya so it's a kind of like a group uh, 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 dynamic in between the 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 animals okay Can you, this is the last uh, the last uh, example of the vignette. Uh, it's about uh, Joe who, who plan us have a ski holiday in this uh, in the winter next winter in New Zealand. So we need to we change into uh, surfing in Bali in a school holiday. So it's a uh, okay. From the example of the slides, uh, two or three slides before, we can conclude that adapting a vignette is more than translating. Uh, translating focus in on linguistic accuracy and maintain the the what is this, the equivalence of the instrument content across the language. In contrast, adapting is involved modifying a vignette or other research instrument to make it more suitable for use in a different cultural context or context, cultural, social, or contextual uh, setting. It is necessary when the original instrument may not be directly applicable due to differences in custom, norm, value, or practice. Thank you so much, Maita. Thank you, Wika. Presentation. Okay, thank you, Buika, for the presentation. Uh, hearing your presentation, it brought back memories of when we first adapt the vignette study on mind reading. Yeah, Bu, yeah. Uh, I know uh, it was hard because we need to like uh, search what uh, activity that's suitable to exchange uh, the story that we have. I think it's originally from Australia, yeah, Bu, yeah. Okay. And I believe uh, many participants here uh, have many questions for you, Bu, about the adaptation uh, process. But before we get to those, maybe we give our time here for our last speaker, Joshua Gabriel. 
Joshua will share his experience in applying vignette in online research. Joshua, you may begin your presentation. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, so okay. Uh okay. Okay, uh hello everyone. Uh good afternoon everyone. And good morning to Hida. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I would. Uh, my name is Joshua, and I would like to welcome you all to my uh, presentation. Uh, so the previous two presenters have talked about uh, the creation and usage of vignettes, and also uh, in how to uh, adapt one for Indonesian use. And so uh, today I'm going to uh, talk in brief about how to apply vignettes in online research. Uh, Okay, so basically, uh, first of all, I'm going to discuss uh, very shortly about why we do an online study in the first place, because as you know, offline studies have their own uh, benefits. Wait, uh, you can, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, so to continue, uh, as you know, um, Offline studies have their own benefits, like you can control the participants better and you can use specialized equipment. So why do we conduct an online study? Well, uh, there are a number of benefits, like for example, uh, the data are saved uh, on an online server, which means that our data at least uh, is safe from any damage or loss of device. Like for example, if our computer gets uh, stolen, uh, well, our data from our study is safe practically. And second of all, it might give us more flexibility in uh, data collection because it's not limited to any one device. So we can just send the link uh, to another person and they can use their device to uh, do our study basically. And it's also easier to conduct the experiment uh, en masse because for example, if you want to uh, conduct a study with 20 people at the same time, we can just uh, borrow 20 devices. Uh, we don't have to prepare them ourselves and Basically, as long as we have the link, as long as the participants have the link, we're good to go. And then third of all, uh, it's also easier to distribute our uh, our study. Basically, you can send them the link. Uh, we don't have to uh, schedule our participants, like uh, make a schedule of when, uh, when, or, when or where they can uh, do our study. Yeah, as long as they have the link, they can uh, basically do the study. Now, but there are a number of challenges faced by online, online studies in general. Now, this basically involves uh, choosing the appropriate platform because as, as you know, there are a number of platforms that we can use to conduct, or to conduct an online study and they have their own characteristics. Uh, like for example, some platforms might be more resilient when it comes to uh, internet disruption. Like uh, while well, some other platforms, uh, if the internet connection is dead, the platform will die immediately. So we have to uh, prepare for these things. We have to take care of, uh, we have to uh, take these things into account. And furthermore, uh, device incompatibility, like some platforms are uh, compatible with the widest range of devices. Like for example, Google Form, uh, Qualitrix, uh, it's, you know, they are compatible across the widest range of devices, while some other platforms uh, might not be so forgiving. So you might want to check if the platform you, that you plan to use is compatible with the uh, participant's device, basically. And of course, uh, fourth, uh, it's it might be difficult to control the participants if we conduct an online study, like for example, uh, the participants uh, might go to the bathroom without telling us, and maybe for some study it's okay, but if you if we want to, for example, uh, measure the speed of the participants, we want to know how long will the participants, uh, how, how long does it take for the participants to finish uh, one item, for example, and of course, them, uh, they going to the bathroom will disrupt this. And finally, uh, because we're not there to guide the participants, uh, the participants might make uh, more mistakes. So these are the things that we have to prepare for. Uh, now, the, uh, those are just online studies in general. Now, uh, are there some things that we need to uh, prepare for if we want to use vignettes online? Uh, well, for example, uh, there might be a possible age limitation. Like for example, if we want to have uh, young children, very young children as our participants, 
uh, it might be difficult because, uh, you know, young children, they occasionally need uh, more prompts, you know, more questions, more interactions. And these things might not be easy or it might be outright impossible with an online study. And uh, even if uh, and even if our participants are maybe we choose uh, to have the elderly, for example, as our participants, it might be hard as well for them because they might uh, find difficulties in uh, using the device. So yeah, using vignettes online, there might be a number of uh, possible limitations. Now, of course, this is uh, also this also depends on the kind of study that you want to use. And then uh, second of all, there might be some uh, limitations in the form of delivery, like some uh, like perhaps uh, you want to use like a role play or you want to uh, showcase to them objects, like you want to demonstrate to the participants some objects so that they can imagine the scenario uh, more fully, for example. And of course, these things are not possible or it might be a bit harder if you want to do an online study compared if you want to do an offline study. Uh, and in short, these forms of delivery, it must be translatable to an, to an online platform, which basically limits you to like uh, audio recordings, videos, or text-based uh, scenarios. And lastly, uh, there might be some uh, limitations when it comes to data collections, like this pretty much, you, you uh, like I said before, it depends on the kind of platform that you're using. Like some, uh, most platforms only allow you to collect data in textual form or maybe in multiple choices. So uh, yeah, these are the things that uh, you have to take into account. But maybe some platforms allow you to submit your, sub allows the participants to submit their responses in pictorial form or in video forms. But then again, this requires more logistics. Uh, which might mean that the whole study will get uh, even more complex, exponentially complex. So uh, these are the things that we have to take into account. Uh, now, perhaps uh, if you want to get around this, you can use video calls as long as it's remote, it's online. Uh, there are a number of advantages, perhaps. Like, for example, if you really want to collect observational data, observational behavioral data, like you want to see how uh, the participants react, perhaps, it, again, it depends on the kind of study that you want to do. And of course, video calls allow uh, video calls allow this to be taken. But then again, even if you want to take observational data, you're still limited by the uh, point of view of the camera, by the distance. It's just not the same. Uh, and also, uh, video calls allow for more interactions with the participants. Like, for example, if your participants are uh, young children, you can interact with them more. <laughs> you can ask more questions, ask more prompts. Uh, but still, uh, uh, for those of you who might have worked with children before, it's just not the same <laughs> uh, because children, they need real interactions. They need direct interactions. And Venus, they occasionally also take like uh, dozens of items and multiple items. So the children might get bored and they might need more encouragements and things like that. So it's still going to be hard even if you want to try using video calls. If your participants are the elderly, um, if your participants are old, perhaps they can work with it because it's simpler for them. But then again, uh, you have to prepare for a number of difficulties in the field. And then this, the, uh, the disadvantages uh, still, because it's, on a, it's an online study, you're still far away uh, from the, wait, from the uh, participants. So it might be hard. Uh, to interact with them. And of course, uh, we know that uh, video calls, they, uh, once the connection is dead, the uh, calls die as well. So uh, it might be difficult. And of course, even if it allows you to interact more with the participants, there might be some limitations in the kind of props, objects that you can use. And finally, uh, vignettes, not all vignettes require these kinds of advanced demonstrations. Uh, many of them uh, are basically text-based, you know, uh, stories like, for example, the strange stories task, uh, they are text-based. So it might be a bit excessive if you want to use video calls, especially because the video calls kind of negate uh, one of the main advantage of an online study, that is uh, the ability to, you know, conduct the study en masse. Now, uh, about the online forms thingy, I'm going to base uh, 
uh, the following explanations on my experience in using vignettes. Uh, that is, I used vignettes to determine the to determine the manuding performance of our participants of my participants. So I kind of manipulated the gender characteristics, the cultural back backgrounds of the characters that I used in my story. So uh, in order to determine the uh, you know the manuding performance, their uh, accuracy and speed of the manuding of our participants. So what comes next will reflect mainly on my experience in using vignettes in online forms. Uh, and then uh, online forms, so what are the things that we need to, uh, you know, uh, we need to take care of? Uh, like for example, uh, first of all, it's important that uh, we choose the, the right platform that we want to use because our platform basically uh, limits us to you know, uh, it limits what we can do with the platform. Sometimes the platform, uh, well, some platforms uh, like Qualitrix, for example, uh, it only allows you to display pictures, maybe audio recordings and maybe videos. Some more advanced platforms like Open Sesame might allows you to might might allow you to conduct more and uh, more advanced uh, data collection collection. But then, but then again, the more advanced the platform, the more advanced the features, but it will be far more complex compared to if we, we are using the more simple, simple platform. And it's important that we keep our experiment simple because we have no idea what kind of computer that the participants will be using. They might be using a 10 year old computer for all we know, it's, it's possible. Uh, and so the more complex the uh, platform is, the greater the possibility that it might fail. Like, uh, for example, uh, and even if you want to try to keep it simple, like maybe you want to, uh, you know, uh, convey your scenarios using text and pictures, uh, we have to keep the size of those files small, like you cannot use uh, a full HD picture, 1080 pixels and 1080 pixels because it's going to crash. <laughs> the, the participant's computer is going to crash uh, most likely. So you uh, like, for example, uh, Open Sesame, the, the platform that I used, uh, it recommends that the whole file, the whole bundle must not exceed 10, uh, 10 megabytes in size. Uh, I exceeded it by a bit, but the point is, uh, the bigger the size, the more complex your platform is, the greater the chance for it to fail. So you uh, you have to keep it simple. And of course, uh, we have to test our uh, form multiple times. I'm going to show you what it looks like later after this. Like I'm going to finish with these pointers and I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like visually, basically, so that you can imagine it better. Uh, because so you have to test it multiple times, and then uh, furthermore, you have to make sure that the screen dimension fits the computer screen of the participants. Uh, now again, this depends on the kind of platform that you're using. Uh, like some platforms, like Google Form, for example, uh, it automatically adjusts uh, the display screen so that it you can basically be confident that it will fit the participant's computer screen. But some other platforms. Uh, it might allow you a greater degree of flexibility in setting up the screen dimensions. So uh, you have to prepare for these things. I'm going to show you what it looks like later after this. And finally, uh, if you want to conduct like specialized uh, specialized measurements, like for example, if we want to display a picture for 50 milliseconds, for example, let's just say we want to display a picture for 50 milliseconds. And then let's say that uh, the participant's computer screen takes about five milliseconds to refresh itself. Now it means that from the beginning, we cannot uh, set the timer to 50 milliseconds, but instead we have to set the timer to 45 milliseconds because after the uh, 45 millisecond ends, uh, the computer will uh, add another five milliseconds for the screen to refresh. So in the end, the participants will be looking at the uh, picture for 50 milliseconds, the intended time. If we set it from, uh, if we set the timer for 50 milliseconds from the start, the participants will instead uh, be looking at the picture for 55 milliseconds, which is which is uh, which uh, is not our intention. So we have to uh, take care of these things. We have uh, and. About the screen refresh rate, uh, I have I I'm not sure what the current number is because the standards sometimes change. But uh, just keep in mind that we have to uh, check this before we want to conduct these kinds of measurements. 
Now, this is basically the stories that I used. So I use this uh, strange stories task, uh, as I've told before. Now, this is uh, one of the uh, control story. This is about a tiger being hungry, and it looks at a bunch of rabbits, and the rabbits flee. This tiger stays hungry, uh, the tiger stays hungry and uh, well, that's basically the story. Now, as you can see, uh, there is a black square in the middle of the screen, and then you can see lots of white space around the black square. Now, this is because I had no idea what kind of computer the participants would, would be using. So, with, so I went with the uh, conservative approach. I imitated the uh, screen size of our old televisions, you know, from the 90s, the, those square televisions, because this way I could be sure that uh, no matter the display settings of the computer's participant, the story, the whole story would be visible because some vignettes, uh, they are kind of pretty text heavy, like the strange story task. Uh, the story is pretty long, as you can see here. Now, I do not want the story, I do not want part of the stories to be beyond the boundaries of the screen. Like some parts of it is outside the screen because that way the participants won't be able to read it. And uh, the whole point of vignettes is for them to understand the scenarios. And without the scenarios, there will be no study basically. Um, and, as you, and there is a picture of the tiger there. And perhaps the picture looks good here, but actually that's just a few megabytes worth of pictures. Like I said before, you have to keep everything simple. You have to keep everything light in order to make sure that uh, the whole thing works. If you, uh, if you use a picture that is, that is too big, perhaps it might fail to load, uh, the, the text might disappear and everything might uh, you know, be broken. So uh, I've talked previously about testing it multiple times because uh, so when I made this uh, story, basically this uh, online form, I used Open Sesame, but then I used uh, Jatos to uh, as the online server. Um, now basically, when I made it in uh, on Open Sesame, it looked like this, like it's pretty, right? You can read everything, but then uh, when I uploaded it to Jatos and tested it it looked like this, basically. So for some reason, the uh, text box uh, got stretched, you know, so that now the participants uh, cannot read anything. It, uh, they can only see that something is hungry and there are rabbits. Now this isn't ideal, obviously. Uh, so like I said, we have to test it multiple times. What works locally on our computer might not work when we upload it online might fail to work when we uh, test it with, uh, with another person's computer and might even fail when we use it with another person, basically. So we have to test it and retest it multiple times until we are sure that everything is basically uh, flawless. So what I did here was that, uh, so the text that you see here, it's not actually a text, it's actually a picture. So I took a screenshot of the, uh, I took a picture of the text so that I could display it basically as an image. So, so Jatos could display images so, uh, to get around it. So I just displayed the text as an image basically, and I could resize it, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, the text is uh, pretty long. So yeah, you have to, we have to take these things into account. Okay, and then uh, next, uh, I know that we're conducting the studies using and online forms. And of course, it kind of depends on what kind of study that you're working on as well. But I find it, uh, I recommend that we accompany the sessions uh, remotely, at least with Zoom meetings or with Google Meet, because, <coughs> excuse me, uh, because I think it's important for us to have a bit of distrust when it comes to the participants, just a bit, though, not too much. Uh, because uh, sometimes even if we have written the instructions there uh, for the participants to read, sometimes the participants might decide to just skip the instructions or they might, you know, just skim the instructions and not, and not read the whole thing. So I found it important for us to, con to uh, basically do a verbal briefings. <laughs> so what I did was that I basically uh, repeat everything that I've written in the instruction page verbally so that I could make I could be certain that the participants uh, understood what needed to be done. Like uh, I also put a certain emphasis on some important things. 
And this way, uh, yeah, I think uh, briefing the participants twice is better than not briefing them at all, basically. And also, we, uh, I think it's important for us to set our expect uh, our participants' expectations, especially because vignettes, uh, sometimes they, uh, you know, uh, like the strange stories task, for example, it has 16 stories, eight control stories and eight mental stories, and the stories, each of the stories are long. Uh, the participants might easily get bored after the 10th story, the 11th story, and then when they click next, and when they click next, and then they think, oh my God, there's still the 12th story and the 13th story. They might get bored. They might choose to skip the story. I just skim the story. Uh, it happened to me, like when I checked their responses, they only like uh, in the, they only uh, wrote a letter or something like that. Of course, this isn't ideal because it means that we do not get a true reflection of the uh, participants' uh, ability. Now, in order to get around it, I from the start I told the participants that they, they would be reading uh, sixteen stories basically. Now, but this is only if your study allows it. If your study doesn't allow you to set your participants' expectations, it's okay. But if your study allows it, uh, I highly recommend that we do that. We do it. Like, uh, but I didn't tell the participants that there would be eight story, uh, eight control stories or eight mental sto stories. I told them no such thing. I only told them that there would be 16 stories, full stop, so that they could pace themselves so that they wouldn't be distressed or they wouldn't get bored that easily when they've reached the 11th, 11th story so that they could pace themselves accordingly. They knew what to expect. They knew what to look forward to so that hopefully the participants will actually ans answer uh, each questions and read all the scenarios so that we can get a better reflection of their true ability, basically. And of course, uh, after that, uh, it's important as well to ask if the participants understand what needs to be done, because sometimes the participants uh, are a bit too shy to ask us questions, basically. Uh, so what I did was that I paused uh, during the briefing and then I asked them uh, if they understood what they needed to do, if they have any questions, so that if they want to ask questions, they can do it then and there, basically. And also, uh, pa you know, participants might do mistakes, like for example, Open Sesame, as far as I know, it doesn't allow you to uh, go back to the previous page, like after you click next, to the next story, to the next page, you cannot go back to the previous page, which means that, well, basically, if the participants accidentally skip a story, for example, they cannot go back to read the previous story. And because the scenario is the whole thing, them, uh, the participants not reading the story is a big thing. So we, uh, well, that's the other reason why we need to uh, accompany the sessions remotely, because uh, if those things happen, we can immediately address the problem. And of course, there might be technical failures as well. A picture might disappear, a text might disappear, things like that can happen. And if we accompany the sessions uh, remotely with Google with uh, Google Meet, for example, we can immediately address the stories and our, hopefully our study can go as seamlessly as, pro as possible, as problem-free as possible, basically. And also, finally, it can be a good protection against possible distractors. Like I said before, sometimes uh, some participants might decide to go to the bathroom without telling us. Uh, with you know, with us being there with them remotely, hopefully the participants will feel bad <laughs> if they go to the bathroom, basically. So this is what it looks like. This is the welcome page. Like I've uh, told them from the beginning, uh, this research will take 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, this is the welcome page that I used uh, for one of my studies. Uh, now, because it takes 45 to, you know, 30 to 45 minutes, if you want to go to the bathroom, basically, you have to do it now. You cannot do it later. That's basically what I told the participant uh, to do. And then I put a certain emphasis, uh, emphasis there uh, with capital letters and many more. And then next, uh, like I said previously, I've, uh, I put there that they're going to read 16 stories. Full stop, I told them nothing else. They're just going to read 16 stories uh, to set the, their expectations, basically. Okay, and then furthermore, we have to make sure that our controls are uh, intuitive. 
uh, I'm going to show you what it looks like after this. Uh, what is intuitive for us isn't necessarily intuitive for them. Again, I'm going to show you what it looks like. Uh, we have to spread visual cues all over the screens because sometimes vignettes, uh, they have multiple uh, stories and even sometimes we pair our vignettes with some other measurements if our online form is long and uh, therefore it's easy for the participants to forget things especially if they have to imagine lots of scenarios you know they might be tired they might be yeah you know uh, dizzy or something like that so it's important for us to spread visual cues so that the participants uh, need not worry about what to press if they want to go to the next page or things like that uh, yeah, basically to uh, to have them to to be uh, to make them be able to focus on the scenarios more basically, but we have to keep those uh, visual cues uh, simple because we do not want them to be intrusive, and and like I said before, we we could uh, put an emphasis on certain facts that we want the participants to remember, and we have to assume that the participants will forget some instructions, which is the reason why uh, visual cues are important basically. Now, this is what it looks like. So after the participants read my tiger story previously, this is the page that uh, they're going to see afterwards. So basically it's the question, uh, why is the tiger hungry, <laughs> still hungry? And then I put in a bracket there, press enter to continue. Now this served uh, two purposes, basically. The first purpose was that uh, because it's to remind the participants that if, you, if they want to move to the next page, press enter, uh, but the second purpose was actually to prevent the participants from pressing enter because, you know, this is the response here is, uh, well, they had to type in their response. So it's a long response, long open-ended response. Um, and sometimes when we write things, when we type things, uh, we uh, instinctively press enter if we want to move to the, pay, uh, to the, uh, to the row below it, like, We've written uh, a sentence, for example, and we, and we want to move to the line beneath it. We press enter instinctively. But in this case, pressing enter, uh, pressing enter will actually uh, bring you to the next page. And the participants can, cannot go back to, the, to this page again. This means that their answers will be left unfinished. And this isn't ideal, obviously. So it's there to remind the participants that uh, they can only press enter if they have finished answering the question, basically. Okay, and this is what I meant by what's instinctive for us is an instinctive for them. This is the thank you page, the last page of my online form, basically. Uh, it says, thank you. Thank you for participating in this study, basically. And uh, for us, maybe it's, in it's instinctive, uh, in instinctive for us to click the gray button, which says finish exclamation mark. Uh, but some participants, it might not be the instinctive, instinctual thing to do. Like for them, perhaps after they, they read the thank you note, they might think, oh yeah, so uh, the study is finished. Basically, I can just close the window. But if they close the window, uh, it means that the data for some reason or another aren't being sent to uh, the online server, which means that the data would be lost. So to make sure that it's an absolute certainty that they press on that big gray finish exclamation mark button, I add another note, which basically says to finish this study, click finish exclamation mark so that they will actually pr uh, press on the button. And then <clears throat> uh, last but not least, uh, we have to make our uh, control more mistake resistant. Again, I'm going to show you what it looks like after this. Uh, I know that it's impossible for us to make a totally mistake resistant control, but we could try, you know, we could try by, for example, uh, using keys that are not commonly used uh, as our control keys. And also, but we have to keep our control uh, simple, like we cannot have the participants uh, ha uh, click, okay, you have to click Q and W if you want to move to the next page, because uh, complex controls create more points of failure. So what I did was, uh, so basically this is another story about the huddling, uh, huddling monkeys, basically. Uh, I used Q, the Q key uh, as a control. So if the participants click on Q, uh, they would move the, to the next page. 
so the reason why why I use Q was because uh, Q isn't a key that we often use uh, in Bahasa, in English, or in German. I think Q is rarely used, so that's the reason why I pick Q. Because if I pick the usual uh, option like Enter or Spacebar, the participants might you know when they're bored or when they are fiddling with their keyboard, they might press Enter or they might press Spacebar, <laughs> the biggest key there is. And uh, it might skip to the next page if they do so. And it's going to be a bad thing because they can't move back to the previous page. So I use Q. And as you could see here, uh, the prompt, the visual Q, isn't uh, intrusive. I, I, I put it uh, at the bottom right corner because I wanted them to focus on the picture and on the uh, scenario, the story up there. And after a number of stories, like this is the 10th story or something, uh, I changed the prompt to just Q dash dash arrow, basically, because by this point, I think the participants know what to do. And of course, because by this point, I think the participants is a bit tired, you know, their attention might be going everywhere else. So I decided to, you know, simplify the cues even further so that they could uh, focus more on the story and the pictures, basically. So basically, uh, that's all for my presentation. Uh, like I said, uh, the I think the main important point is that uh, to choose the appropriate the appropriate platform that you want to you want to use because every platforms have their upsides have their downsides so the platform is the main thing uh, if you want to use uh, online study basically okay <laughs> thank you very much that's all okay thank you Joshua thank you for your detail explanation <laughs> on your experience uh, using an online research uh, that uh, using vignette yeah uh, uh, i think uh, the research that Joshua doing right now is like a series on mind reading uh, ex uh, research uh, so in the beginning uh, me and Buik uh, also doing the online research during COVID and we start from the very basic uh, app and yeah, there are so many limitation and then uh, in the next uh, series of the mind reading research, uh, we have Joshua <laughs> to help us on the detail of the online uh research uh, practice and preparation. Thank you, Joshua. And I believe uh, many of our participants here also has a question for you. Okay, uh, uh, now it's time for the most exciting session. I see here some of you already post question in the Zoom chat. So maybe I start uh, to read from the beginning, we have Valerian Geraldi, Andy. Uh, she has questions. She has two questions. Uh, probably Hide, Buike, and uh, Joshua can answer. The first question, uh, she said that she have seen so many vignettes uh, study used in the quantitative study. Uh, can we apply vignette to the qualitative study, like uh, to dig or inquire more information from the participant? Who wants to answer first? Yeah, I yep. put already something in the chat uh, yeah. as a replay on it. Um, yeah, of course you can use it, and depending on what you exactly means with qualitative studies, but you can say okay, you. You can use it with an interview study as well. Eh? Uh, just give give them the, the an example. Uh, but I think when you really you can the best to use it in what I see qualitative study is more to get the understanding why people answer sometimes of something. Um, you can use it as an opener. So you start with okay, uh, like this scenario. Scenario. Uh, what do you choose? Uh, and then you can ask, okay, why do you choose this more? Is this really like an opener for um, the story? And then you get more in depth why uh, people do something. So, uh, yeah, I think that, but then you, 
then it's not really a, a vignette study because you mm -hmm. are not really interested in in uh, the outcome per se, but you're more interested in the uh, in the, the reasoning behind why they choose. And, that, and that's, I think, the biggest advantage of qualitative research that you can get that why in which, which you get not that easy in qualitative research. Okay, thank you, Ida. So uh, we can use vignette as a, like uh, the first stimulus before we uh, move into our question uh, on deeper on how uh, maybe the perception or other thing that we want to dig more in the qualitative study. So that's what you think. Yeah, yeah. okay. Maybe uh, you have uh, things to add, uh, Buika or Joshua? Okay, thank you, Ita. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I agree with uh, Hida that uh, if we, uh, uh, vignette can be also uh, employed for the qualitative study. It depends on the, what is this, uh, on the question that need, research mm -hmm. question, our research question that need to be uh, uh, answered. So for example, like uh, 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 if we would like to ask why, why some people or some children think about uh, this uh, phenomena so it's i think it's more like a qualitative uh, the 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 what is this the uh, answer is open ended and then we need to uh, classify the the answer into a category and mm -hmm. that's also is a qualitative uh, study so we don't need to we don't uh, we focus more on the different uh, reason behind the thinking process of the children so okay. it's not uh, not all only for the quantitative but also for the qualitative study so like for example the uh, moral uh, development the reason why mm -hmm. yeah the the uh, the the researcher uh, uh, focus more on the reason why the student or the participants answer this way, a certain way. So it's a more like a qualitative uh, uh, analysis. Studies. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, Valerian also asked, uh, does Vignette uh, study really have any gender bias if we put a gender name like David or Diane in a Vignette story? Maybe we so can try really... to answer mm -hmm. because in, in this, uh, I think it's if I'm not mistaken, it's in the it was taken from the Motom Moral mm -hmm. Theory of Mind, and it's a it's a uh, the study was uh, conducted for the children uh, age around five to six, and according to uh, psychology, uh, mm -hmm. developmental psychologists, uh, uh, children on the on the that stage age is uh, more likely to have a friend with the same uh, same sex same gender mm -hmm. so if our participant is a female or girl so we we present the the what is this, the story about Diane but mm -hmm. if our uh, participant or children participant is a boy so we present the picture or story about mm -hmm. Martin so mm -hmm. it's a yeah, it's a not not study about gender or gender bias, but it's a the uh, the study about uh, the what is this? We adjust the according to the um, what is it? The the real situation that for the children around five to six, their friends most likely is the same uh, sex or same gender. So that's okay. my answer. Okay, thank you, Bika. Okay, next one is come from Raudiatul Zahra uh, or Dia. She asks, uh, what is the difference between Finnish study and situational judgment test in psychology? Maybe Wika or Hida, <laughs> if you are familiar with situational judgment test. <laughs> I'm not as similar with the uh, uh, situational judgment, judgment test, but I think there is an overlap. Hmm, a big okay. overlap. 
it was more like uh, because vignette studies are originally uh, from the political science mm -hmm. and they go through the social sciences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Just we get it like uh like an overlap. But yeah. uh, probably Buika would like to add me too. I don't have any. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. Let's try. <laughs> Ask the AI maybe. Let's try. <laughs> okay, maybe Joshua? Joshua? Uh, okay. Yes, so sure. As, huh? as far as I know, uh, uh -huh. situational judgment. Wait, right. Uh, okay. Uh, situational judgment test it's intended uh, mainly towards uh, like gauging your performance like what mm -hmm. would you do mm -hmm. if the situation is uh, like this or like that uh, while vignettes it's basically they both use uh, scenarios but vignettes uh, not that focused on uh, trying to uh, predict your performance like situational judgment test uh, it, it tries to predict your performance like while vignettes uh, they don't really do that all the time like for example one of, one of the stories that I used like for example uh, like the tiger thingy that you've uh, read previously it doesn't really ask you about what would you do if you see a tiger it asks mm -hmm. you why is the tiger hungry, but of mm -hmm. course the intention is to, uh, if to you know to to see if you can uh, guess properly whether the tiger is uh, is hungry. But again, the intention is uh, different. The focus is different. They both use uh, scenarios, but uh, situational judgment tests. They are mainly to see uh, what will you do in a certain situation. You know to predict your performance uh, in a future job, for example, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not completely agree with that, Joshua, because no. like the thing yet studies I showed you, we use, mm -hmm. they we ask, okay, what do what will you choose? Who's better? Mm -hmm. Who do you choose? The European Union or the national government of both. So that's completely the same. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just it is from another field, so that has another label and some other um uh focus, but a vignette and a, a situational adjustment test yet it's just because we are this is from another field it is a different name but the idea behind this is completely the same and the way you can uh, analyze it is also completely the same so uh, yeah because yeah so it is i think it's there is the a big overlap different name, basically. Yeah. yeah okay okay so uh, in vignette study, we can like uh, dig uh, like the same aspect in the situational judgment test, uh, but probably in more broader vignette study can also uh, not only specific certain aspect uh, like we do in the situational yeah. judgment test. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you, can, you can say that... Um... Within the field of vignette studies, the situa situa situational judgment yeah. test yeah. Are, is a part of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next question is coming from Leah. Uh, she asks, how would you decide the length of the vignette? Because sometimes the situation is complex and you have to describe the situation in lots of words or sentence. So how you manage or how you decide how many sentences uh, this story uh, you create, maybe he didn't want to uh, ask. It, it really depends on the level of your respondents. Yeah. So the problem is that you have often with, with survey research that higher educated people are going to answer it. Hmm. Uh, and that is not what you want because mm -hmm. in it, of, in general, it's not what you want because you want to have an uh, the, that the whole population is uh, mm -hmm. can fill it out. Mm -hmm. So the shorter the better. Mm -hmm. uh, we also do. Of we, it's not that long that we do it. So twenty mm -hmm. years ago, it was really high, high educated, and um, um, we have almost no low educated who understand it. And nowadays, we check if surveys if they are. Uh, we call it B1 language, mm -hmm. so very basic language, if people mm -hmm. can understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means that you use short sentences, uh, mm -hmm. 
and you really shoot something and like, like uh, Ika also already said, maybe words aren't the best way to use. You can also use uh, pictures, for example, yeah. uh, because pictures can, yeah, anybody can see a mm. picture mm. despite you are blind, but that's mm. another story. Um, so, but the shorter, the better, because then ev everyone can um, fill it out or can understand it. Okay, thank you. And how about uh, you, Joshua and Buika? Uh, because uh, the participants of uh, your study include children and also Joshua probably more into students, right? Uh, how you decide the length uh, of the story of the opinion? Okay, for me, it's a... It depends on the age of the uh, uh, participant, like for mm -hmm. the, the age. Uh, well, of course, the vignette, uh, the participant needs to be a uh, can be a uh, so they have to be uh, able to read before mm -hmm. <laughs> it is vignette, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, the younger the age of the participant, so the shorter. So for the mm -hmm. like for. Uh, uh uh what is this uh, all their participants or adolescents we need more we can have a uh, longer but but uh, i agree with uh, uh he that uh, the shorter the better mm -hmm. so we need to keep just to really a very uh what is this uh efficient with the uh, with the uh word so the uh, other uh, uh decision we can make it so through the pilot study so it, sometimes we also ask the whether the uh, vignette is too long or mm -hmm. they have an, ad, uh, they, they have uh, any idea how to uh, shorten the the uh, or shorten the the what is this the sentence in the in the uh, vignette okay thank you Joshua, do you have anything uh. to Yep. Okay, I, I think I agree with Ida and Mika. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the important thing is to ask another person if they understand what mm -hmm. uh, we want to do with the stories because, well, that's basically uh, they are the ones that are going to read the story. So mm -hmm. their understanding is, of course, uh, number one, I think. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, thank you. Okay, for the second question from Leah is, is there any suggestion to minimize social desirability in vignette where the participants are presented in a moral choice? <laughs> Who wants to answer? <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. difficult. Um, mm -hmm. It really depends already on the setting. So when you have... Uh... When you have a, a, how do you say it? That you have a paper and pencil survey and there is a, somebody who's uh, at home with you to mm -hmm. do it. And then there, of course, there's more desirable answers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you compare it to online or mm -hmm. when you have to send it back uh, by post. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really helps how you introduce the question. Hmm. So some when you say okay, some people are the one the opposite, but other things the other opposite, and th then you already feel okay. People are mm -hmm. thinking nuanced uh, or differently about it, so I can give a different answer. Hmm. Uh, so it really yeah, yeah, the only thing to do it is with um, the introduction of the question of the hmm. topic, okay. and when you make then the the response then that it is that they feel that they can give every answer, then it's fine. Hmm. So you should do something with that. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Hide. Yeah, I think one of uh, our problem is social desirability in every kind of study. We have like using questionnaire, using vignette. Uh, we need something uh, to prevent uh, more on the social desirability answer. Okay. Uh, Probably this one for Hida from Muhammad in Zamam Khan. Uh, he uh, has a background as an industrial and organizational psychology major student and new to this uh, method of vignette study. 
So he asked, maybe you can provide guidance on how effectively actively apply Vinya study in the field of organizational psychology. <laughs> Probably you have in uh, additional <laughs> advice no. for. <laughs> I don't know because the 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 survey of the the, the, the example of the, the the complex one that mm -hmm. was in a survey we used together with uh, uh, organizational psychologists mm -hmm. and they do completely the same mm -hmm. with different with different uh, topics but uh, yeah, I don't see how to do it how what how you should do it differently it really depends on okay uh what's your research question and, mm -hmm. and because yeah what i do is mostly is uh research based on big groups so uh, uh then it's perfect to do it like i did but if you want to do it more qualitatively yeah then then use it as an uh, you can use it as a like i said before as an opener for your interview of an uh, how do you say it? that it starts the interview and it uh, gives you have, so you have something to talk about um yeah that's what i can think about it but okay. i don't know <laughs> if i answer the, the question now <laughs> yeah thank you Hideo. probably if uh what is it um, uh, muhammad is um, want to talk more or discuss yeah. this with the speaker uh you may yeah, contact uh, our uh, committee here and then we can give you yeah. <laughs> email so you yeah. can uh, discuss it by uh, email. Okay, yeah. is there, oh, we have a limited time here. I think we already in the end of our Q&A session and we already cover all the question. Okay uh so yeah uh thank you so much to all the participants for joining us today and i hope this uh seminar has provided you with new perspective information insight and yeah knowledge using uh, the vignettes in uh, research Let's uh, give us maybe applause uh, by giving uh, the icon in the Zoom to our speaker here. Uh, thank you, Hide, uh, Buike, and Joshua for sharing your experience with us. And maybe before we leave, uh, I would like to remind you to uh, kindly fill out the attendance form at the following link in the, in the Zoom chat you you can uh, just click uh, the form and maybe we can take a uh, one group uh, picture together in the zoom <laughs> before we leave it's usually common in every <laughs> online seminar you can uh, open your camera okay Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Kame, would you take the picture? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Okay, maybe um, I will take the picture in one, two, three. We have three pages here. Yes, and <laughs> for the second page. Oh, okay. No one open. Uh, no one is. Oh, yeah, no okay. <laughs> no, we can. Okay. <laughs> can skip. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining us and uh, see you in the next research day. Please follow the Faculty Psychology social media to have information about the next event. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.